there we go. I'll have to do a small edit now, but you, you are on line. <laughs> so for me, when it comes to slurry design, nothing matters but four things. There are four things that matter to me with slurry design and nothing else. Yeah, nothing else. The first one is I want a slurry to be designed so that it provides a tight bond. That's very important to me that the cement will grip the casing and will bond to the formation. That's very important to me. We'll see when we look at pumping cements to prevent corrosion or to help trap CO2 to keep it from leaking, how important a tight bond is. I want the slurry design to prevent gas flow. Nothing matters to me except a tight bond and that the cement is designed to help prevent gas from flowing through that cement. The other key thing that only matters to me is that I'm able to place it. There's nothing worse than pumping a cement job and it goes out and not up. So lifting cement is really important to me. That's what matters. So when I design a slurry, does it give me a bond? Does it stop gas intrusion? And is it designed correctly so that I can pump it and lift it? What is the fourth thing that matters to you or that you think matters to me? What is the fourth one? As I told some attendees this morning, I think I may just sit here all night and just let you answer that. And I'm sure someone will come up with it, so go for it. What's the fourth thing? That we can pump it, the thickening time. And Mark, Mark, that's the quickest correct answer on this that we've received. That we can pump it and thickening time and good isolation, those are very important. Those are kind of captured in the three I'm talking about. If we can't pump it, you don't have a tight bond and you haven't lifted it. Avoiding an early set. If it sets up early, you don't have a tight bond and you're not lifting cement. But Mark hit it. Thank you, Mark. It needs to be cost effective as well. If it's not cost effective, at least in the eyes of the operator, you're not going to be pumping the cement to do a great job anyway. As we move forward, the agenda for this evening, we'll talk about how to design a slurry. Where do we start? How do we do it? We're talking about slurry specifications. Two weeks ago, we talked about testing. We tested for a reason. We tested to meet some sort of target. Now we have to pick the right targets. And then we'll focus on three specific design issues. How do we get high shear bond? That is, how do we bond to the pipe with the cement design? Preventing corrosion, the whole issue around CO2 sequestration, and designing to prevent gas flow. We will start with a quick review from last week. See what you remember. This is an easy review, by the way. True or false, our final slurry design that you come up with, that we come up with, is determined by testing in the cement lab. And be careful because you know I like to ask trick questions sometimes. True or false, our slurry design that we're going to use in the field is determined by testing in the cement lab. Okay. See, I, I ask, I, I tell you, I ask a trick question just as part of the trick question. Don't be shy. <laughs> See, I'm confusing you. I guess that's part of the purpose <laughs> of what I do. Now the trues are coming through. 
Samples are sent from the field for final confirmation. That's right. What do we do with those field samples? We test them in the lab, correct? The answer is true. I'm sorry to tell you it was a trick question. Question two, this is maybe a trick question as well. Which of the following people have the most stubborn habits? Maybe you already know somebody and already have the answer to that, but I give you a choice of three here. Be careful. A is your spouse or significant other. That's not true in my case at all. No stubborn habits, but it might be for you. B, a burrow, or C, a cement lab technician. Which of the following people have the most stubborn habits? Well, we have kind people on today. No one's going after the spouse, and I like that. <laughs> Natalie knows. Natalie knows. And the answer is, yes, it's the lab technician, a very focused, neurotic, strange type of person. I know I, I am one or was one. I guess you're always a lab technician. Again, my first job with Halliburton, after I went through training, I spent six months doing lab work in cementing in Oklahoma City. Natalie's been there too. <laughs> The reason is you learn a set of ways to do tests. You're doing those tests every day, all day, five, seven days a week. We work seven days a week, every day of the year. And you get into habits. And the reason I bring this up is that when you go to design a slurry, it ends at the lab table with the design technician doing the work. It's not just having the properties or specs, but the way you test to get those specs become very important. And as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the lab tech may follow API, but mostly he'll veer a bit and each lab will have their own set of ways that they determine the best slurry. It's hard. Here's what I did recently, just a few weeks ago. I didn't like, as I said, the design I got back. So I said, we need to change something. And I asked to change something to correct a property. And I got back saying, we corrected it, but it's unmixable. Well, that's not a good design. Can you fix that? We fixed that, but then we didn't get your property. We can't meet your specs. And I thought, well, what are your specs? And they had no specs. So in kind of a tight jam. So we had to design and get ready to pump a cement that didn't meet our specifications. It's very interesting. Stubborn lab tech. I know you. Final part of the review here, we are going to design a slurry based upon six lab tests. As we'll see, we can design by testing more than those six, but every day we have six tests. One is density. We may determine density by doing a mass balance, just going to the computer. It will tell you when you put these additives in, at this density, here's how much water, or if you put the additives in the water, it will tell you the density. You can design that way, and that's your density, but then we can weigh it. And so one of the tests, one of the performances we want is a cement of a certain density. What else do we want? Viscosity. TT, which is thickening time. Mixability, we're actually going to talk about mixability a little bit. That is definitely, if you can't mix it or if it mixes poorly, it's, it's key. I put that to the side. We have rheology related to viscosity, a UCA for compressive strength, fluid loss, one more I see we haven't mentioned. Static gel strength, 
We can do gel strengths as we test for algae. You can do a separate test for SGS. It's not the normal everyday test we'll do, but we do a lot of them. And the other is free fluid or free water. We have thickening time, compressive strength, rheologies, fluid loss, and free water. Free water would include settling, and as just mentioned, static gel strength or gel strength would be involved with rheologies. For these six tests that we're going to do, we have to have a target, and I'm not sure we always do. We have to have specs as an operating company, as a service company, recommended specs. For those of you who don't know me, I worked for Halliburton for 23 years, but then I went to work for Oxy as their global cementing advisor, and then on to Talisman and Repsol as their global cementing advisor. Had the chance to work all over the world, and everywhere we worked, we had specifications for our cement. We tendered all of our work. We had contracts that included specifications, and we had specs for these key tests, but also for others. And that's what we want to talk about a bit. So how do we design this slurry? If you had to put in one word, I design a slurry by blank. How would you, what word would you put? How do you design a good cement slurry? I had a friend, he could just, I just designed slurries. He would say, I may not be the best, but I'm always in the top five, whatever that means. By knowing the requirements, but once you know the requirements, how do you get there? How do you design it, Natalie? It's by meeting the specs, having standards, but how do you meet the specs? When we have our course, we break up into teams, we design slurries. And I tell them, I train them a little bit, and then I tell them design a slurry, and they say, you gotta be kidding. I'm not an expert to design a slurry. And I said, I don't care, design a slurry. We only have a four day class, design a slurry. There we go, we experiment, we trial and error, we test, test, test. We have knowledge of our additives. We know how things behave, good stuff. That's how we design. Here are the words I use, but this is important because it's going to take us to where we need to go. I say it, it takes reason, it takes data, it takes testing and it takes experience. It takes simple reasoning. If I add an accelerator, it's going to accelerate the cement. It's going to set it up faster. The reason is our knowledge, what we know. I know to add water to cement instead of oil. I know, I know how to mix it. I mix it for 15 seconds at 4,000 RPM. And then I mix it for 35 seconds at 12,000 RPM. I know that, that comes from my knowledge. I went to a Halliburton course and I learned that. The data is others knowledge or previous tests that someone else learned something and we can go to a database to help design slurries. When we're having our course competition, I tell them, call anybody, go anywhere. You've got a couple hours to design. You can ask me. I won't give you the design, but I'll answer your questions. There's a great deal of knowledge out there that we can tap into. But then here comes the tough part. We still have to take a guess. We may be looking at a situation that we can't find the data for, the exact densities we're looking for, or the temperatures, or the well objectives. And we have to have trial and error. Someone mentioned that. Now that's not fun if you're taking a course and you're trying to win a competition and the winner gets a cash award and you have to trial an error because it may be an error on your first attempt. In the course, you only have one attempt. So trial and error we struggle with, but it's okay because we do that. 
We try something, it doesn't work, we adjust it. And then we take it to the field. This is where we don't always close the loop. We don't always take what we've tested. It looks good, I think it's great. I think we hit it, hit the mark. In the second session today, someone said, we have great design, great specs, but we keep getting a failed job. We keep getting flow on our wells. Then it's not a good design or they're not good specs. You have to adjust to get actual field results. So let's start with our knowledge, what we know. Let's go to the basics. Let's start with a particle of cement. I won't spend long on this particle of cement, but this, this polished etched uh, photo here of our cement particle, you'll see that a piece of cement, this is just one piece of cement floating around, a, a dust particle. It's just microns in size. This is a big piece of cement, probably well over 100 microns. But within the cement, you have crystals, beautiful round crystals that give us long-term strength. The tricalcium silicate or the big angular crystals gives us short-term compressive strength. The C3A gives us fast set. Oil well cements, G and H, don't have much C3A. And this crystal, we're going to add water to it. All of those crystals, think of cement as crystals. Incredible product, foundation of the civilization. And we have all these crystals going into the water. We've got a beautiful cement being mixed and all these crystals and all these particles are going to start to hydrate and bond. That cement is made by adding a lot of sand, a lot of silicon, a lot of limestone, calcium crushing it and melting it, and then cooling it and grinding it, and you get this beautiful hydraulic material called cement. So you take that beautiful particle, you mix it with water, and an amorphous structure starts to build as these particles bond, and you see the particles of cement. The sticks there, that's etrangite, but even though sticks may not exist as they do, when we freeze cement and look at it, etrangite doesn't show up like that. Some think that etrangite, much of it is formed as we dehydrate the sample to take a picture of it. But pretty, pretty complex chemistry is going on, much of it theoretical as the cement starts to bond. We add the water to the cement, we get a certain weight. These are the normal densities, water requirements, and yields of cement. A sack of cement is one cubic foot. You add water to it. The amount of water you add and other materials will give you a yield for every one cubic foot sack. How much cubic foot of slurry do you get? Tell me, type one cement is a construction cement, but the other API classes, which class is the most finely ground cement, the smallest particles? I just saw Tom's comment. The smallest particles, I'll say it real. If someone ever gives me the wrong answer, you always never say it's the wrong answer just repeat the question or say it's an interesting answer until you get the right answer. As a teacher, that is a tip I give to you. So class H is an interesting answer, but what is the smallest particle? And Octavio sees it, it's C. We know it's the smallest particle because we have to add more water to it to wet all of the surface area. And when we add the extra water, its normal density will drop because we're adding more light water and it drops to a 14.8. If we look at class G and class H, chemically they're the same. We make out of La Harve, France, had the opportunity to go there a couple times. We make a class G and a class H, or at times they did. And the chemistry is the same. It's just the G is a more finely ground cement. 
So when we test it for API, it has specifications for API. They're the same for G and H. It's just that you mix them at different densities. Won't go into this, but every base cement that's API is tested to make sure it's API. The problem is this. Here we are storing this. We're storing this in Illinois, Joppa, Illinois, on the Ohio River. I went and visited there. I actually took an elevator to the top of these silos storing the cement. This cement will be loaded onto a barge on the river. Here I am taking a picture of a barge on a river. It's going to go to New Orleans. From New Orleans, it will be blown into silos and then a train or a truck will pick it up from there. It'll blow onto the truck. It will go down to the service company down on the coast. It will be blown into their facilities. It will then be mixed with additives and blown to another boat. That boat will go to the rig. We'll blow that cement onto the rig and then we'll fluff the cement and blow it to the cement truck. So although we've tested the cement here, it now will go through a three week journey, maybe sit on the rig for a, a month. And during that time, it will gain moisture and it will change. That's one reason it's so important to test, test and test cement changes, not just from brand to brand, but over time and definitely from batch to batch. So here we have our cement and we're going to, we're going to start having a bit of knowledge of additives. I won't go through the additives. We'd be here all night. Here's one of our competitions some years ago, but here's the Americas. I don't recall, but I guess we must have had uh, the team members from North and South America. But we're going to mix this cement in the lab and to the cement, we're going to put all of our additives. This was, <laughs> this was true, Tom, but we have a lot of coffee here. We have gel or bentonite in this mix. They were bold because I always say slurry design, the more simpler, the better, but they added paws into their slurry because I also told them, if you want to be adventurous, paws is a really good way to design slurries. They also have some retarder and some dispersant in here as they try to win the award. And we mix those in the blender. And that is our cement blend. We'll take a look at that. I wanna say a word about cement blends. The cement blend here would be considered the pause with the cement with the bentonite. That's probably a 50-50 pause, half-half cement with a couple percent gel. And save that question, Vahid. I, I wanna make sure I understand that question. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So hang on to that question. It's a good question. I just wanna make sure I understand it. The 50-50 pause is a great tail slurry as well, Tom, but we can design it. We usually use 65 cement, 35 pause with 6% gel, that kind of thing for a lead. But cement blends can be leads, but they can be silica flour for HPHT wells. And they also can be general type of blends. And you know the names for them. I won't mention all of the names. We'll mention some names later. I don't think the companies get too upset, except when I say the name and then say something bad about it. But this is a cement system that floats. It contains hollow spheres and it floats. And we call it a certain name. That doesn't mean because it has a name, it's a good system. And I'll keep repeating that because even now as we get into more advanced reasons for running cement, you get a system name. And so people ask me, does that system work? I don't know if it works because what happened here, imagine this is a foam cement. We were doing a foam cement program in Oman and we were pumping foam cement. And one of the other service companies came in to convince us that foam cement was bad. And what they did, they went to the lab and designed a very heavy cement 
put a lot of nitrogen into it and created a permeable foam, a bad foam. And then they would put it in the water and watch it sink. And they went to our engineers and showed our engineers that foam cement was bad because it was permeable and would sink. And I had to tell them, that's one name, Tom. <laughs> and I had to tell them, no, it's just a service company that's trying to trick you. They've created a bad foam, just as you can create any sort of bad cement. The name doesn't do it. So when you look at cement blends or cement systems, it's not the system that's working. It's the properties of that system. It's the performance of that system. I won't go through all the additives, but let's look at the general list. One thing we have enough of, and that's additives. Uh, you can put anything in cement. We learn a lot from the construction industry. And again, as I worked in research, most of the people in research were chemists developing additives that could be sold for major profits. But we have accelerators, retarders, low fluid loss additives, dispersants, heavyweight and lightweight additives. We put some real heavy metal into cement sometimes or cements that float, lost circulation materials. We have specific gas migration control products. Some of them are fluid loss additives that are just renamed something that has the word gas in it. They're marketed as gas migration control. Free water control or viscosifiers, expansion additives, chlorides to put salinity into the cement mix, and a number of special additives from elastomers for elastic cements to dyes, self-healing cements, someone asked me about today, anti-corrosion, other special additives. So we have the additives. Don't worry about not having enough additives. I say that, but I warn you, I was out in Midland, Texas. It's been about a year and a half, two years ago. And we were looking at some designs for a major company there. And I said, well, here's how we design the slurry. We just need this and this. And I went to the service company and they say, we no longer offer this and this. We only offer a few products. We've streamlined our inventory. You don't have the opportunity to run a synthetic retarder or to run a certain fluid loss control or a non-viscosifying additive. We've gotten rid of it all. So I say there are plenty of additives, but we are streamlining in many areas of the world or in many districts. We're streamlining. So you, I guess you got to be careful there. You know what, Natalie? That is, I appreciate you saying that. Natalie says defomers are pretty useful also. When I grew up in the oil field, defomers were an add-on. We used them on every job. We had defomer on the job and we used it in the lab, but we never charged for it. I guess about 15 years ago, someone said, why are we not charging for defomer? You know, we can make millions charging for defomer and we need defomer. So everyone pays for defomer. I was, the reason I was gonna say that, I was going to put that on the list and then I, started drinking coffee or something and forgot to. So thank you. Defoamer is in every blend except foam cements. And you're being charged for it. It's okay. The discounts the way they are today, we need to charge for things to survive. We need a lot of information to design cements. I didn't really give you a chance to answer that, but we need well data. The key thing we need is pore pressure frat gradient to determine what our density will be. And as we pump it, our frictional pressures, to make sure we can place this, we need a density and a slurry viscosity. We'll talk about the density that we need and the viscosity that we need in a bit. We need the casing size depth. We need to know the job placement time. How big is this job? That's gonna determine what our thickening time is. We'll talk very seriously about what our thickening times should be. I personally believe we're missing the target too often. Then we have to know the temperature. The number one thing that affects cement 
design is temperature. And we have to know what we're trying to achieve. What's the objective? Do we have high permeability, a depleted zone, a salt that we need to bond to? That will determine free water, fluid loss, and other of our properties because temperature, certain additives are only stable or only work at certain temperatures. And we need to know that. Let's talk about temperature very briefly. At Halliburton, I had the opportunity to be the technical advisor for several regions, Europe, Africa, Asia Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, Permian Basin. When I went to Indonesia to work, I went to our lab in Jakarta, great group, great lab. I walked in and I said, how do we determine temperature? Now we know bottom hole static from thermal gradients, from offset logs, that's, but we know the undisturbed temperature. How do we determine bottom hole circulating temperature? And I'll never forget it, some things you never forget, because I was learning Indonesian and I'm trying to bond with Indonesia. And I said, what do we use? And they said, we use a formula we call the New Orleans method. So in Indonesia, years ago, they used the New Orleans method, a laboratory formula to determine bottom hole circulating. We have softwares like Wellcat that are very accurate. We've got to be careful using logs, but we can use offset logs. And then we have uh, API schedules. Not, I don't know how many use API schedules. They estimate hot temperatures. But temperature is important. Wellcat, and here's an example of it. Wellcat, you see the blue line here. That's the undisturbed bottom hole static temperature. We can follow a sack of cement and see what the temperature does. Increases. Here's bottom hole circulating. Comes back up. And we get a little hotter on surface as we circulate. This is a great program. I knew Wellcat when Wellcat was owned by the originators, Entertech actually helped to uh, connect and for Halliburton to buy Entertech actually years ago in Norway. Good program. This is the important thing about this slide though. When we test thickening time, we get to the bottom here. We keep the slurry at that temperature the whole time till it pumps off or thickens. We're very strict on this cement slurry. We build in safety factors. And that's just a hint that sometimes we may be over retarding the slurry or having huge safety factors. Temperature, key, very important. We put all of this data in, we design based off of this data, and then we see what the compressive strength is and hopefully meet the specs. If not, we redesign. The compressive strength, not always, but quite often directly related to the density or the water cement ratio. Do you have for your area, for your types of wells, for your company, do you have cement or cement slurry specifications? Yes or no? Again, I just cemented a well recently here for a company. They did not have any cementing specifications. Whatever the service company gave them, they used. <laughs> we can talk about that, Tom, for sure. And we will when we debate our safety factor. I appreciate the comment. I do appreciate that comment. It has happened to me more than once, for sure. Well, it is important. Thank you for your comments. It is important to have specifications, not only to that we pump a job correctly or safely, but that we get into the habit of following that slurry to see if it's a successful slurry and knowing why it is. Otherwise, you get into the habit of saying, you know, we got a good job with the super cement blend. Let's always run the super cement blend. 
but we need to understand why we're getting the good job with the super cement blend. So we're going to go through seven specifications of our basic tests. We'll then wrap up with special designs as we look at bonding, corrosion, gas flow. The first, mixability. You see here, we're going to try to get all of this cement into the blender within 15 seconds. That tells us something about mixability while spinning at 4,000 RPMs. Absolutely. The whole issue of water is another thing with design. If you don't have the, the location water you're using, we'll use distilled water. Sometimes we use tap water. We should use distilled water. And then we'll get that water sample in. But we're adding the cement to the water. And we can get mixability ratings. We used to just say it mixed or it didn't mix. Good mixability or bad but or not mixable but now we rate it with numbers the one on the left this was during a competition in pittsburgh pennsylvania and it's a poor design there's a lot of dry cement sitting on top of an impeller that's trying to turn i think in this case the blender started smoking before it could be mixed now when we have a mix like this in one of our courses uh we're allowed to add water till it is mixable and then test at what density that is. But it's kind of fun when this happens. I mean, the other teams get a big kick out of it when your cement locks up. But that would get a zero rating. And see, Natalie is stubborn. She says you should never lose the vortex. Ever? Never. I see the words. Very stubborn. And then we have this nice, easy to mix within 15 seconds, nice vortex. We never lost the vortex. And we get a five. I've seen fours and I've seen threes that I would rate a five. So there's some subjectivity in this. And Natalie has a great point. She says that if it looks bad in the lab, it will look terrible on, in the field. That is true. I've experienced that again and again. We can mix them thick in the lab, harder in the field. I just looked at a job, and it's a, a bad cement job, and I'm not totally blaming the mixing of the cement, but the comments were we just couldn't mix it in the field, and the density was all over the place as we were packing off. I'm not sure if that was the total reason, but it yielded a bad cement job. Mixability is important. Thank you. Density. What density do we want? How heavy do we want the cement weight? Tom, your comment is well taken. Because when it looks fairly good in the lab, that's why we send it out. And sometimes it still looks bad in the field. Good point. What cement weight do we want? And why do we want that cement weight? Give me some comments. Sufficient to maintain well control, both in the static state, worst case, and while we're, we're pumping, we need to be higher than pore pressure to maintain well control. Yet light enough, Natalie says, so that we do not frack the well, exactly. Why else do we need a certain density. Why else will we choose a certain density? So it's between pore pressure and frat gradient, both in static states, worst case, and east pumping, worst case, with friction. It needs to be a weight, usually we have a density hierarchy, so it's the cement weight is some amount over the mud weight so that we can also place a spacer of a certain density. For a kickoff plug, good point, Mark. A lot of the things we're looking at here, we're thinking primary cementing, but 
it doesn't even have to just be kickoff plugs, Mark. Mark says kickoff plugs, you want a density that will give you the best strength. We may want that for primary as well. Matt has a great point, dollars. And overall, we can use the density to make the cement sing and dance like we may want it to, not just for compressive strength, although that's a great point, Mark, but for everything. So we want the slurry density be between pore pressure and frat gradient. We want to design around the mud and spacer hierarchy. We want to achieve the required performance properties. It could be compressive strength. And then as Matt says as well, not just spacers costing money, but cement costs money. And we might want to do things with density to make it fit for purpose and cost efficient. And even if we get the perfect design in the lab, you may want to work on another design that does the same thing at a better price. Number three, thickening time. So we got our density. We've chosen it. Sometimes we have a wide range and we go just to a certain density. You can adjust it. What about thickening time? What do you want for thickening time? And to recall, the thickening time is the time for a cement slurry while it's being stirred. Here's our consistency. It starts to gel up. It finally gets to 70 Bearden units. You may use 40 Bearden units for a lightweight. You may use the point of departure here. You may use 80 Bearden units if you're in Oman. You may use 100 Bearden units if you're doing an API test. But for whatever consistency you consider unpumpable, it's the time from when you start applying conditions down hole to when it's too thick to pump. What do you want for a thickening time? Let's debate this for just a minute or two. When you design a slurry, how much thickening time do you get? When I worked in the lab, I usually received, we want four to five hour thickening time. We always give about an hour space because we know the variability of cements. So we get a window usually or a minimum for thickening time. Tom writes mixing time plus pumping time plus a safety factor. And mixing time plus pumping time would be the placement time once I've mixed. We might even throw in there with the pumping time once we placed it, a hesitation and a circulation of cement off of the top of a liner. So we may have some hesitations or shutdowns in that placement time plus a safety factor. So what value do we want? We want the placing time, placement time plus a safety factor. What do you want for a safety factor? And, and there's not much of a debate here because we're all, in my opinion, a bit shy when it comes to thickening time. And Tom mentioned the reason why before. But I want to encourage you to be brave and to be bold. How much safety factor do you want, Tom? Anybody, how much safety factor? Natalie says 90 minutes, Ron, two hours. I have no problem with that, I, maybe. In case of any operational issue, we want safety factors. Two hours, two hours, okay. That's normal, and I understand it, and if I never fight that. Sometimes I fight it. And I will stick with this recommendation and we can debate a little bit on it. But understand the reason I put this in here is just for critical well cementing. I received information last week from a, a very difficult well that's being drilled in Europe and the well was a failure. It was cemented. Actually, we drilled out the shoe. We did an FIT and as we were Finishing the FIT, the well began to flow and kicked. And I don't know what it's been now. Two weeks later, they try to fix that flow. It's flowing down and around the shoe. And that's when I say we're looking at how we're cementing the next one. 
we have to be more aggressive. I've recommended this not just today, not just last week, but throughout my career on critical cementing. You'll know when you have critical cementing. I, in the afternoon session, someone said, we have specs, but we keep getting bad jobs. Well, I, I think I mentioned that earlier. We have to change the specs. And I see more and more over-retarded cements. The job we were getting ready to do production, the cement wasn't setting up for 14 hours. We're doing an expandable liner hanger where we have to shut down for four hours. We have a 12 hour thickening time. The cement's not setting up for 20 something hours. Now I know a two hour safety factor is not going to kill your cement necessarily, but you need to set the cement up. And I believe we've already built safety factors in. We don't need to be so, so I don't wanna use the word scared. <laughs> we don't need to be so cautious. Uh, let's debate this during the question and answer because what happens in a lot of times the well locks up i don't think it locks up because of cement issues and if it does those can be fixed there's a lot of reasons we lock up i don't think we flash set cement due to thickening time very often i'm almost afraid to see your comments Yeah, I got you, Tom. We'll talk about that in question and answers. Let's move on. Viscosity and yield point. I'm not going to spend much time here. This is because it, this all revolves around rheological hierarchy. When I grew up in the oil field, we didn't use rheological hierarchy. We used turbulence or tried to. And we've learned a lot since then. Maybe we've learned too much. I don't know. Here's a slurry. What do you think of this slurry? This is back to the America's competition running the pause slurry. Can you look and see what you think about the viscosity yield point? What do you think with, about this slurry? So it look thick or thin? What does that slurry look like to you? I have a feeling the America's didn't win the money. I just have a feeling, but yeah, it looks thin, doesn't it? You can see some of the pauslin floating out a bit, but it looks thin. I like thin slurries, but what do you like? Yeah, this one's probably too thin, but we can build some very thin slurries that don't settle. My favorite design, and, and this flies in the face of rheological hierarchy, but it we sure get great results. And that is to put into the system a lot of fines. Actually, some of the famous systems now are built on this. We used to build them by hand years ago, but you put a lot of small micro silica into the cement and you disperse it. And you get very low viscosities, but you get full suspension because of the fine particles of the micro silica. Those are my favorite slurries, but and pause slurries can give you that wonderfully. However, this is probably too thin. Some companies like thick slurries. I like thin slurries. I like thin slurries because we can mix them better. I know a major company that like thick slurries. And as Tom alluded to, we could mix them in the lab. We had to cut the additive offshore because they were too thick to mix offshore. Thin slurries help us with cement placement, lower ECDs and the ability to pump again after shutting down because thin slurries usually have good low gel strengths. And thin slurries with those gel strengths are helpful for preventing fluid influx. And I understand the it depends because it does. There's not a one answer to rheologies. But generally speaking, what do we want in a cement slurry? I would choose a lower YP. I worked for a major operator. We pumped a lot of thin mud ahead of our cement jobs and followed it with not super thick spacers and not super thick cements. We wanted flat gel profiles 
And we'll talk about critical gel strength at the end. We wanted that period less than 30 minutes. We'll talk about critical gel strength at the end. Thank you, Christopher, good point. There's a point I wanna make about what you just said, Christopher, as well. But the critical gel strength API recommends, I think, less than 45. I say we go even shorter. Uh, and we're going to get to this. Remind me, if I don't say it, Christopher, shout out. Talk about pumping through small IDs as we get to our next topic. And here it is, fluid loss. Fluid loss on the left, if you recall from testing, will apply 1,000 PSI and try to push cement through a 325 mesh screen. Cement will not go through that screen. It will bridge, but fluid will be pressed out of it. To the right are the filter cakes that are shown. 128 cc, a flat filter cake, the one on the left. 276 cc, which sometimes we use. You can get some big filter cakes in the press with the 276. CC fluid loss. Those are API fluid losses per 30 minutes of pressing liquid out of the cement. Here's a question I often get, Christopher, going back to your point. When I pump through a restriction, do I need to put fluid loss? If I pump through a port, if I pump through a bit, if I pump through float equipment, if I pump across a pressure drop, do I need to put fluid loss additive? We used to pump through a mud motor and we would be required to put fluid loss additive in it. And so I would put a little in it, but I will tell you, you do not need fluid loss when you're pumping across a pressure drop. We can debate that a little bit, but you do not need fluid loss until the cement particles themselves stop moving. And across the restriction, they stop moving because you get cement buildup not because you get fluid loss occurring. So we pump, I, I've pumped hours through bits and ports without fluid loss. Why do we need fluid loss in a cement? We'll talk about that when we talk about gas migration control, so put that on hold. But how much do you want? How much fluid loss out of this cement with the API test? Knowing it is a severe test, our permeabilities are not through 325 mesh screens. They're through mud filter cakes, damaged uh, per, uh, permeability, and much lower permeabilities than we get through the screen. But how much, based on the test, how much fluid loss is allowable? What's your number? Let's start with a production, critical production slurry, maybe even gas flow potential, what fluid loss do you want? I can tell you how to get zero, but what we're talking here, uh, Christopher, we're talking about not what floats out, but what we can push out of the cement. It's hard to get zero. To get zero, that 325 mesh screen must be a plate that's so damaged that nothing can go through. Thank you, the uh, whoever commented on that. It's Sai Hui, Sai Hui. I don't know if that's correctly pronounced, but 50 cc's is a common number that we want less than 50 cc fluid loss. I would might I might even agree with Mark that we might for certain situations go even lower. Certain systems like a latex system, and Mark, I'm sure you've run many latex systems. Uh, inherently will give you that type of fluid loss. That's one thing that makes them such good products. So we can, we can tighten it up and I'm not against that. Generally speaking, from a fit for purpose cost effective, I would say less than 70, I have no problem less than 50, unless it takes me $100,000 to get from 70 to 50. Lower than that, I have no problem. Set your specification. We're gonna talk about why we need the fluid loss, but set it and test it and then confirm it. I'm gonna show you a little bit later, a couple logs that confirm it for me, but 
you can say I need less than 50. Show me the data where your field results are better, less than 50, than they are less than 80. Test it. Get the experience and really believe, not just because someone said 50 is good, but that it, 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 and not that it only makes sense, but that you get the results. Here are some numbers. For remedial cementing, we have a pretty good handle on it. We've tested it and we've looked at it very closely down hole. We can get a 70 cc fluid loss as we squeeze a well. We can get 70 cc fluid loss in a 2000 millidarcy formation. We then can go wash that out and we can go take a look at the nodes built with the, can with the filter cakes, the nodes with the camera. And we see that for 70 cc in 2000 millidarcy rock, we get about a half to three quarters of an inch node. I posted last week something on LinkedIn and uh, someone came in and gave a picture of those nodes taken by a camera on the North Slope. It had been a long time since I'd done work, that kind of work, and had seen those nodes. So we understand how the lab relates to the field in squeeze cementing, but we don't have it documented real well for primary cementing. Do you know what we're doing here? Review from last week. This is in a lab fairly recently, and it's nice to see. We're not conditioning, although we are in here in an atmospheric a consistometer that does condition. Exactly. We're doing free water under temperature. Beautiful thing to see. So often we get ambient and we're testing free water here. This one's pretty straightforward. What's not straightforward is how do we test for it? We want zero free water. We do not want water floating out of the cement, but you need, but you need to be able to test it in the right way. I want zero free water under at least bottom hose circulating temperatures. And we can also do settling tests and get more sophisticated. But from a free water test, our specs are zero. And we want that especially horizontal. It becomes critical. Our test, not vertical, but now we want it at an incline of 45 degrees. How much water floats out? We want zero. For non-production leads and tails, we can live with a little bit. In areas of the well that aren't live, if we know those, we can live with it. But for key cementing, it's pretty simple. We want zero. Someone asked this morning, if you're in the field, how far off can you be with your density and still have zero free water? That's a good question. We had an expert in the webinar, and he said he had been involved with tenders where it's obviously dependent upon slurry, but you could be off by up to 0 0.4, 0 0.5 PPG, and their slurries were still having zero free water. But maybe it does at least show, and maybe we don't have that kind of leeway, and it does show how important it is that we mix it right on location. And we'll be talking about continuous mixing and batch mixing and how we apply this slurry design on February the 17th, we'll be talking about pumping cement and what goes on with operations. I also will say if you're off, if you're on location, if you take a sample and you sit it down and you let the rig rattle it, you're going to get free water. And there's an interesting comment from Ahmed. I don't think there is zero free water. That's an interesting comment. In the question and answer, we can talk about that. I know we have zero free water in the tests. I think Ahmed's saying, I don't think we can go out in the field and mix a good cement with zero free water. Maybe it's because you've seen all of the samples and none of them have zero free water. Maybe. Because you go out on location, I agree with you. You got to treat the slurry very kindly and you got to mix it very nicely. Interesting point, Ahmed, thank you. Finally, compressive strength, before we get into some special design considerations, 
This is a UCA processor. We have three algorithms that we normally use with the UCA for lightweight, standard, and heavyweight slurries. We'll send a sound wave through to tell us how much strength we have and when did we get that strength. Very useful tool. You can run a cylinder inside this UCA chamber and then pull that specimen out and crush it to confirm. Or you can run cubes of cement and crush them as well. How much compressive strength do we need? How much do you want? What do we design for? Compressive strength has always been, in my book, my friend, but it's gotten a bad rap over the years that we need tensile strength and we need flexural strength and we need, need low modulus elasticity. We need a certain mechanical integrity and we can't go by compressive strength. But to this day, we still, day in and day out, test compressive strength. So it must be our friend. What do you want from compressive strength? How much do we need? I'll help you out here. Here are several scenarios. Let's go through them. Tell me what you need for each of these. I'm going to put some numbers up. Someone asked me, are these API numbers? And I say, no, I just made these numbers up. I made them up from experience or from reason or from hearing others speak. Hmm. Ron says 50 PSI for the first one. He must be looking at my notes. I don't think you need much strength. Mm. Ron, you've had to look at my notes. Have you, have you seen this before? I don't think you need much strength to stop liquids. And I increase for gas because we have a lot of gas leakage with poor bonding. As it, so I want to tighten the bond and to do that. I often have to tighten the compressive strength. We did a lot of tests, Cook Inlet, cold waters, the North Sea cold waters. We watched gas bubble to surface. And to be honest, we were able to stop that gas with less than 1500. We could stop it at a very low, but I increase it because of the bonding issue. Gas is tough. How about to support the casing during drill out? Sasha jumps in. Hello, Sasha. And she gets it right. Natalie wants more strength, and that's fine. Normally, we think about drilling out when we get 500. To achieve an excellent bond log. You know, I think I've only shown one bond log. We're going to look at a couple bond logs here in a bit. We cannot go too long without looking at a bond log. But to achieve an excellent bond log, how much do we need? Fair enough, Natalie. I, I can go for that. How much we need for an excellent bond log? Minimum amount. I need at least this much strength. I always use this number. It comes strictly from experience. When I get less than this, I've seen a lot of various numbers of bad bond logs. And I also use 1500 PSI. Again, with certain blends, that may be well true, Ahmed. And if I have 3,000, the log's probably going to look a lot better. To contain stimulation treatments. Ah, I don't know. I just want to fill it with solids. We're not going to frack and put much into, this, into the cement sheath. And I'm putting it low. I don't know that number, but I don't think you need much as you break the rock if your small, confined annular space is full of a solid. To nipple down BOPs, this one's been set. I, I was on an API committee that talked about this. How do we safely nipple down BOPs? There's a whole discussion around it. Some want to nipple down just with gel strength, but API settled on the fact that we need strength. Thank you, 500 PSI. And then we have the Railroad Commission which mandates 
the properties in Texas. And I love Texas, but these may not be overly stringent rules. But as the Railroad Commission sees it, we need our lead cement to have 250 PSI. It needs to be there within 24 hours. The tail cement needs to be 1200 within 48 hours, used to be 72, and then to drill out once again, 500 PSI, the critical cement. Set your strengths to match whatever you're trying to achieve. But for me, the most important thing is that it sets up fast. I don't want the cement lingering in the hole with just gel strength. Uh, too many disasters of over-retarded cements. We don't have to go too far. Assam, Macondo. You can go down the list. We over-retard the cements too much. A good design, often the winner of our competitions, meet all of your specs, but who gets the strength the fastest? I want it to set up fast. I want to be able to tap on that cement securely as fast as possible. And when we build safety factors, when we add retarders, when we extend that thickening time and extend that set time, that makes me uneasy in critical wells. So those are the basic slurry design parameters. Set your specifications, test them in under the right conditions, and then follow them to the field. I would love for lab techs to be out on the location seeing how their cements are mixed. I would love for the engineers and supervisors and managers to take the results and say, this is our slurry, be it results from production or results from logs. I'm going to skip that slide and tell you that there are a number of other additional slurry performance properties you can test and need to test. We're not going to cover all of these. I'm just going to cover the top few. But we can test shear bond to see what kind of shear bond we have. We test for expansion. I was running it. We were putting expansion additive in a couple months ago into our slurry of a special system. And I just asked, what was the expansion? We'll, we'll look at this in a bit. And we had no expansion data. We were running expansion additives in popular systems with no data, no, no performance. Corrosion resistance, compressibility, everything around what makes a cement gas tight, settling, compatibilities with salt or shales. Adding silica flour and other things, higher acids and other high temp retarders for HPHT wells. Lost circulation capabilities. We put lost circulation into the cement. That also helps us with fallback. We like to put fibers in. They're very good for lost circulation. They're not good for fallback. Cellophane flake would be something much better for fallback. We do contamination testing between muds and spacers and to see spacer and cement, will it still set up? Mechanical integrity, sensitivity testing, adjusting densities above and below to see how the cement reacts. Even heat of hydration for permafrost or hydrate. We can test a lot of things. I don't even put here permeability, which is an important one. We're only gonna look at some of these top ones here in the next section. And we'll start with shear bond to combat both gas, gas leakage or leakage and corrosion. We're talking about getting a nice bond to the pipe and a tight bond to the formation, or in this case, it's another piece of pipe. This is so important to me. We're going to see you can have the greatest cement in the world. If it doesn't bond to the pipe, fluids are flowing. And I think we ignore this way too much, both in the way we operate and in the way we design slurries. So shear bond is force per area. The force to push this piece of casing out of the cement 
divided by the area that's cemented. That would be the circumference multiplied times the length of the pipe. That's shear bond. And I want that cement to grip tight. Here we have an ultrasonic log. We finally get to a log. Let's start over with the cement map. This is an acoustic impedance map. And here we see a galaxy pattern. I was reading an analysis yesterday and they called it a fried egg pattern. I hadn't heard that, but it kind of looks like a fried egg, but we call it a galaxy pattern. That indicates the narrow side of the annulus where we're either touching or close to touching the formation. On the wide side here, we see a channel. We go over to our amplitude map. It gives us indication of the inner surface of the casing. When you have dark spots, it's either debris or holes in the casing. In this case, it's corroded casing. These are holes in the casing. The radius, you can see loss of mass of the steel. And in our casing thickness, this is the steel, you see another channel. The red means less thickness. And so I ask you, where's the channel at? Is it in the cement or is it in the steel? Where's it at? Is the channel in the cement or is it in the steel? It might be, Tom. It might be. The fluid that is flowing here is a corrosive salt water. It's salt water. This is a famous part of the US where corrosion is an issue. I don't know. We have identical patterns in the cement and in the casing thickness. Understand the ultrasonic. If you get a casing that is etched, then it's gonna show up as if the cement is etched. So I don't know if there is a channel in the cement. There might be, but I do know there's a channel in the steel. I've lost mass. Matter of fact, I've lost so much mass, I have holes in the casing. But how did I get fluids here to even begin to corrode the casing? Did it go through the cement? Did it go through the steel? Or did it go through the interface of this cement and steel? And that's where, again, we get some help from what we see in experience and what we see with ultrasonics, it's likely the interface. And so I just say this, whether it's cement or whether it's steel, if we have an interface where we can travel the cement, we're in trouble. We need a tight bond. Matter of fact, when it comes to corrosion of cement, steel, or anything, we need the following three things, especially cement. Let's focus on cement. The cement, if it's going to corrode, it must be acid soluble, or in this case, it would have had to have been salt water soluble, but it needs to be exposed. You need exposure as well. And for cement, you not only need exposure, you get an insoluble residue. It could be a salt, it could be a calcite that forms, that's impermeable. You gotta wash that off and start etching or acidizing again. Interesting stuff, and it will become more and more interesting to the cementing discipline it already is as we talk about CO2, storing it downhole and worrying about the carbonic acid eating up our cement. This is a huge issue, boy, especially in the political world as we move there, a huge issue. I was looking at some stuff Oxy was presenting this morning uh, online about all of the carbon capture they're looking at doing, putting it back in wells, and they're going to want cements there that will stop the corrosion. But you will need solubility, exposure, and transport to achieve that. Take a look at this. Let's start with sulfuric acid. I had the opportunity to work in Indonesia, in Sumatra, on the side of a volcano near, near Sarula. 
and we put a lot of cement into the sides of the volcano in bubbling sulfuric and carbonic acids. They're called fumaroles. And we put hundreds of samples. Ultimately, in 1998, we wrote a paper about it. Here's the samples, how they come out. On the left is an anti-corrosion resistant cement. If I told you the name, you would recognize it. It's a non-Portland cement. On the right is your standard 15.8 class G cement. In the fumarol, it eats about 30, 40% over weeks. And we, we looked at it for months and years. There's still cement in the side of that mountain. But in weeks, it ate that. But remember, what does it have here? It's bubbling, it's churning, this fumarol is. It's got acid solubility, it's got exposure, it's got transport. Here's hydrochloric acid. We tested this for squeeze cements for Southern California. And the squeeze cement that we tried, we put a lot of pozzolan into it. We put a lot of pozzolan to take out the Portland cement because that's what acid likes to attack, the free lime, the calcium. We put the pause in and look what happened. It's the one on the right. It melted in minutes. And we tested the pause we were using was acid soluble. It was a mess. So we didn't use that system. We used the system on the left, which was a low permeability Portland cement. Seemed to work pretty well. Generally speaking, acid solubility, cement is 40%, but you have to have exposure and transport. So when someone tells you Portland cement is 40% acid soluble, that doesn't mean behind the pipe you're eating it away. It means you're working hard with full exposure to melt this thing. When you add pause mix, take out the Portland cement, the calcium, it drops, although I note there, sometimes it really can cause damage. You have to test it. Low fluid loss slurries prevent the acid from, to, from coming out, uh, coming into the cement, and so it even drops it down. Low permeability is key for acid resistance. Latex slurries, you drop that fluid loss even more. You start coating particles with latex and you drop even lower. Non-Portland cements, we saw a picture of one. They're not acid soluble. But here's the key, be careful. Non-Portland cements may not bond well to the pipe. So what does it matter if the cement is not touched, but you can communicate everything up the side and attack the steel or go into other formations or to surface. So bonding remains very important. And I wanna bring that up as we talk about CO2 sequestration and carbonic acid. Very important is the critical temperature and pressure and moisture content that CO2 is injected. It forms carbonic acid. We tested it quite a bit. I worked for Oxy where we, out West Texas and New Mexico, we inject CO2 a great deal. So we tested this very stringently. And after leaving Oxy, we continue to test it. Here's one of the tests we're doing. Carbonic acid, supercritical levels of, of CO2 under pressure, moisture, creating carbonic acid. And this is typical of what you'll see. You'll see slurries here, non-Portland that look pretty good, but you'll see Portland cements and you'll see the pitting or the precipitation here. And what that does, actually, when we measure in carbonic acid, these samples that are attacked gain weight. They don't lose mass, they gain mass. And here's what they gain. They gain calcium carbonate. When you put cement with carbonic acid, it's the carbonic acid attacking the free lime, the calcium content, and it creates a calcite. This is what it creates on the outside of the cement. There was a paper written by Subhash Shah and others, and it even showed as carbonic acid attacks the cement, you precipitate an impermeable calcite and you increase the shear bond. Work was done by Kinder Morgan in West Texas where they drilled through CO2 wells. What they found were tightly bonded cements with a layer of calcite between casing and cement. Pretty amazing work done. So I just want to say, 
we do want to reduce the Portland cement content, but we, we want to make sure we're bonding and not just take a sample of cement and throw it out there and say, this is the answer. It also has to bond and lock in to be a good anti-corrosion resistant cement. We have to have the exposure. And if we can bond tight, that is key to having a good CO2 storage cement. My last slides show a lot of green foliage and you'll see a lot of marketing of cements for being non-Portland and anti-corrosion resistance. Just be aware, you also need bonding and you also need low permeability in the cement. To get that, we need expansion and we'll be finishing up here in the next five minutes or so, if you can hang with me. If you have to go, I appreciate you attending the webinar, but we're gonna go just a few minutes over, not long, and then we'll have a question and answer session. But here we're testing expansion. Baker had used some of these cubes with springs. Normally you'll use a radial mode and we're just measuring how much the cement expands. We add magnesium oxide. You can add some other products to get expansion. We can see here, this is in sandblasted pipe, but a control in sandblasted, we double the amount almost of shear bond with expansion additives. We actually can increase it just with surfactants as well, which is interesting. How much expansion do we want? I used a very good system, I thought, last month. We had expansion additive in it, and I asked how much expansion do we get? We had no data. I did some tests, some work in Canada, where all of my results, we weren't getting expansion, although we were adding expansion additive, we weren't adding enough. How much expansion do we want in percentage? What do you think? And then we're gonna to quickly touch on gas migration and call it a day. How much expansion do we want? If you have too much, it breaks up. If you don't have enough, it does you no good. Just to not have, sh not have shrinkage is a good thing, but how much do we want? I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for Tom to give me the answer. I know you got the answer. That's a lot. That's a lot. Or as I would s normally say, that's an interesting answer. Close. As a matter of fact, I have to put my glasses on to make sure there's not a decimal point in there. Thank you. Normally, we're looking for somewhere from 0.3 at least measured expansion up to 1.2. It, the cement unrestrained, if you're confined, it's no big deal, but unrestrained can start to crack up a bit above 1.2%. 3% a lot. You might be fine in a, in a confined area. Let's move to gas flow. So designed for preventing gas flow. I'll be very quick here. We take a gas zone, a permeable zone. Sooner or later, because of gelation and fluid loss, we're going to go under balance. When we start the well, inside the well bore, our cement and mud weight is this much more than our pore pressure. We have more pressure inside than outside. As we gel and lose fluid, we drop. And the two have to work together. But as we start to drop, what we will drop because of gel strength from here to here, how much gel strength that is, is called the critical static gel strength. It's the amount of gel strength it takes that with fluid loss combined, how much potential we have to drop due to gelation. And we have a formula for that. But sooner or later, we're going to go under balance. We'll get gas entry. It will form a permanent channel. The channel will look something like this or may. It may not be a pure gas channel. You may have mud come in with it. This is from the Gulf of Mexico, a well we abandoned there. 
what we want is low fluid loss. Equating with that is low permeability. The gas systems, and I can name them all, from gas block to gas stop to gas band to gas check to gas con to paragas, all of the gas systems will have low fluid loss and low permeability. That's key. It has to have low perm. That's one reason fluid can't leave. It's low unset permeability, as well as creating a filter cake. We also want a certain gel strength. It all revolves around fluid loss and gel strength. And there are other reasons given, but I've tested the latexes I, of, from all the service companies. I've tested the other systems. The good systems all have a delayed gel strength. Although you can have a fast setting gel, a thixotropic that can stop gas too. It's got a delayed gel strength. That way, the gel strength down here is delayed. By the time it gels and we lose hydrostatic, fluid loss rate is very low. We also want a fast critical gel strength period. Once we calculate our gel strength that it takes to lose over balance, from there to 500 pounds per 100 square feet of gel strength, that's the critical gel strength period. Now that pressure loss, I'll go through it very quickly. Going through this transition, we want it to be quick. But the maximum pressure restriction, which is the pressure loss due to gel strength, we're up here. What we lose due to gel strength is based upon, if we know what that pressure loss is, the difference of our overbalance, we calculate critical gel strength. The cement column is the height in feet. The effective diameter is the total clearance, annular clearance. And we can calculate the pressure loss. We know what pressure we'll lose. We can calculate what our critical gel strength is. I hope that's clear. So we can use fluid loss and gel strength. Latexes do that, other polymer systems do that. Or we can go compressible, that's my recommendation, either foam cement or in situ gas generator. Foam cement's not an option in many places. I like the in situ gas generator. A lot to say about that, maybe when I turn the cameras off, we can talk about it in the q and I base that upon results. Oh, it makes sense. A compressible system doesn't allow, it compresses. It doesn't allow fluids to flow in. But these are in gas wells, multiple layers. This is well number 38 out of 38, perfect cement job. And when we perforate between gas, we have isolation. We do six, seven treatments on these wells. I base it on results. A compressible cement, alumina will create a bit of hydrogen gas, which makes it compressible down hole. There are some rules and risks that you have to take in running it. You don't wanna bring this cement to surface or to the top of a liner. You will find some wells where the porous zones, these are porosity, that's where we have influx. The best way to solve this as you line it up and, and systems that we mentioned Conventional systems can work very well. When they don't, you go to a compressible system. Those are the best results that I've seen. I'm wrapping up quickly. I thank you for attending. I would like to summarize by saying a couple things. You're going to see, as we talk about CO2 storage, you're gonna see a lot of pictures of rainforests. And I understand that, but I'm not worried about the rainforests in my catalog. I'm worried about the performance properties. Cement systems that claim things are wonderful and they may be brilliant, but they have little meaning to me in good slurry design because of a name. They have to have the performance properties. And in that needs to be bonding. It needs to be low permeability. It needs to be able to, where we can lift the cement as well. So I will close by saying the focus of every slurry design should be increasing the bond, preventing gas flow, and designing it so we can achieve full returns. And then we have to understand that let's design them cost effectively, as cost effectively as possible. 
We design cements by our knowledge. Talking together gives us more knowledge. By experience, let's compare it to the field and let's just keep testing and get the right solution. Every cement pump should be designed to meet certain specs. Have your specs and test them. And then let's look at the field results, confirm those designs. Well, thank you for attending the webinar. We'll now take time for question and answers. And I hope to see you on February the 17th when we'll be talking about pumping cement, taking this design and pumping it into the field. Thanks again for attending.